Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman. I'm a board-certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every week on Wednesday to provide the veterinarian and the technician team some actionable things that you can use in your practice. And this episode is going to be a recorded episode that we've done in the past, not a podcast that we've recorded or not the Vet Dental Show, but actually some other information for you that we know you're going to enjoy. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll see you at the end of the podcast. All right, Julie had a question. This is a great question. Um, any recommendations for labs for histopath? <clears throat> Dr. Cindy Bell is our uh, pathologist of choice. She does only oral pathology for dogs and cats. She used to be at the University of Wisconsin. Then she went to Kansas State, and now she has her own lab. Uh, she had uh, extensive experience uh, at Wisconsin and developed a love for oral pathology. And consequently, now she's got her own lab. She opened this up a couple years ago. And the URL, put Cindy Bell and SOPA, and it'll come up. But the, I think it's sopforanimals.com. <clears throat> but that is where I would suggest that all you guys uh, that have cases where you would uh, not have something routine, especially uh, that looks a little unusual, that you would send your, in, your um, histopath to Dr. Bell. And Dr. Bell is going to require uh, that you also send uh, radiographs and also send gross images uh, to help her really fine tune some of these tougher cases. She's amazing. There's nobody like her in the world. She's the most experienced and the most thorough. So if you have a case uh, or if you want to use her for everything uh, oral, uh, certainly that's the way to go. A lot of our Academy members use her exclusively uh, only for, uh, for that uh, purpose. Christina, uh, do we sell this product in our clinic, or is the company willing to sell to wholesale? Uh, Healthy Mouth, we personally do. Currently only keeping, I think, Annie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're only keeping the 8-ounce uh, with us, and the option to order from the client's standpoint online uh, is there as well. So they will, uh, I th I'm pretty sure you have to call the company, set up a, oh, what's the term, set up a, an account, uh, with them, and they will deliver at distributor prices to you where you can sell from the clinic, or if you don't want to fool with that, uh, you can just have uh, that and let the client get it. The, I think the problem with, with letting the client get it uh, the first time is that probably they're going to forget, but if you dispense the this, this small 8-ounce bottle or whatever it is uh, first and let the client use it, then um, you get them used to using it, they're more likely to reorder or they're more likely to get it from you again. So um, I think that's a good way to do it. If I had to put a catheter in now, I probably could not. <laughs> I, did, I did the same thing when I was uh, in emergency and critical care for 13 years. We didn't always have an extra tech there. I did put a lot of catheters in by myself. I always intubated, uh, or not always, but most of the time intubated by myself. Uh, and lo and behold, when I, uh, when I ran into Annie, she's really the only one that has ever done that. And now Jen's doing it as well. So it's, uh, it's really great to have that. Uh, and and uh, it's a good skill to have and a good one to learn. And, it's all, it's, and why I'm on that subject, I think this is important. We, we have always, there's a lot of things that we've always done. This is one of them. We've always assumed that we need somebody to hold the patient and we need somebody uh, to, to hold uh, the arm off. Uh, you don't have to do that. Certainly, if there's any question about whether you're going to get bitten or in a case of a cat scratched or otherwise bitten, then you definitely want a muzzle. There are going to be some cases where you don't uh, uh, or you won't be able to do that. But if you are a practice owner and you have techs that are pretty good at putting catheters in, guess what? They can probably put a catheter in by themselves without the help of another tech or you. Uh, it's just a matter of paradigm shifting. 
<clears throat> Same thing with our anesthesia protocols that we use. Uh, we just keep the patients really light. And so we don't have problems under anesthesia. They wake up immediately. Most practices don't do that. Uh, so it's, it's part of thinking, hey, how can we do this different? Those are two examples where we've always done it that way, so that's the way to do it, which is not correct. Uh, it doesn't have to be done that way. Sorry, sometimes I just talk about things that I feel like talking about. I don't talk about things that I should be talking about, but I think you get the, you get the picture. Looking at this question, when we're differentiating any oral inflammation in a cat, where stomatitis is a potential rule out just because the tissue looks angry adjacent to the teeth. If you biopsy that tissue, if it's, if it's significantly inflamed and it's been there for, for weeks to months, that, that biopsy is going to very likely read out as stomatitis. The respect that it is stomatitis does not mean, definitely does not mean, that that is feline gingivostomatitis. The differentiating factor between any oral inflammation adjacent to the teeth and feline gingival, gingivostomatitis is caudal oral mucosal inflammation. That being said, the reason why that is read out as um, as stomatitis is it's very similar if not identical just because of the influx of plasma cells into that tissue because it's chronic. You take it from the caudal mucosa or the gingiva it's, it's going to probably read out exactly the same even though it, it could be periodontal disease. So d there is really there's really no reason, unless you suspect squamous cell carcinoma, to biopsy a stomatitis case. If you've got a case where you've got uh, a, a juvenile, or excuse me, a gingivostomatitis case where you've looked at the cat with the mouth open, and not only are the teeth affected, but the caudal oral mucosa as you're looking back beyond the pallidoglossal folds is also reddened and infected and, in, and uh, most of the time proliferative. So that is the differentiating factor. It's not histopath. <clears throat> the, only, the only, again, reason that I would biopsy a case is if I had a unilateral, more proliferative uh, area in a bilateral case or if I had a unilateral inflammation back there, I wouldn't be thinking stomatitis. I would be going straight to thinking squamous cell carcinoma. Could be some other mass. It could be something else. But that would 99 probably percent, if it's a unilateral mass, it's probably going to be uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So um, I, hope that, I hope that straightens that out for everybody. That's a very important distinction. We get a lot of patients that come in where and the referring veterinarian has looked at the patient and the patient may be anywhere from seven months to 10 years of age and they're referred for stomatitis when actually they may have had a biopsy before, but the patient doesn't have gingivostomatitis. They have, they have just stomatitis in the attached gingiva adjacent to the tooth because it's severe gingivitis. <laughs> so I hope that, hope that clears everything up. If there's no boarded dentist, uh, you could certainly refer to a surgeon uh, for oral masses. Unfortunately, as a group, we have had some pretty bad nightmares in having to go in and repair things that surgeons have, have done in the past, either ectomies or uh, uh, more commonly, uh, fracture repair. So, Always, if you have a choice, refer to a, a board-certified dentist. They have had actual practical exams where they have had to do those procedures and had to pass those procedures uh, with uh, uh, other dentists grading them. And 
that has to be virtually perfect in order for a dentist to become a board certified dentist. <clears throat> Surgeons don't have any practical exams. So um, you can bet that you, the, the veterinary dentist is going to be well, well um, trained to do anything like that over a surgeon. So there, there may be surgeons that are better than uh, some board certified veterinary dentists that have had training specifically or experience. But in general, um, the best bet is a board certified dentist. I trust you enjoyed that episode. We enjoyed providing it. If you would, do us a big favor and go to our iTunes page, post a rating and review, and take a picture of that with your cell phone, and then post it on our Facebook page, and we'll send you the Instrument Use Essentials course. If you also look below, there is a link to two live trainings that we do. And one is on radiographic interpretation. The other is on killer tips for quicker extractions. If you have not been to those, register for the one that's coming up next. And the link will be in the show notes on the website, The Vet Dental Show. And we'll get you in and get you a 30-minute, 40-minute overview of those topics that are really insightful and all take home and then we'll also give you an opportunity to get a great deal and some bonuses on those two courses that are online courses that span uh, five hours and seven hours. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Hopefully you'll help us out uh, with the post on our Facebook group. And then as a little extra bonus for you, you've got that link down there. You can register if you haven't been to either one of those and enjoy all of that content uh, that we're going to give you on those two topics. So take care. We'll see you next week.